So it's a good idea to take care of your hands and make tools that fit your hands. That's one of the safety things about this. There's not, a lot, there's not chemicals used, there's not a lot of dust, that's small, fine particulate matter, so it's, it's not really toxic to people. The one thing, the danger of it is your body and like damaging your tendons and your wrists and your fingers. So take the time to make tools that fit your hands or that are at least comfortable. So this is a, a moose leg bone, and we were using this the first day of scraping at the Wellness Center and using this part here, which is smooth, just to squeegee out the water and really push and help loosen up the fibers. This bone can actually be used as a scraper for doing the flushing action, and if you carve out the, the bone part here and the marrow that might be left, these create two edges that when you're scraping on the hide, they act as the scraping tool in that action. And this is just a, a part of a leg bone that I did nothing to other than age. It's been outside for like four years, so it doesn't have any oils in it anymore, and it's softer. Um, because it was aged outside in like the UV light. If it would have been buried or if it would have been boiled, it would actually be even more porous. So this is still strong and it has smooth parts to it. The other side of this that's shaped like that, I'm gonna um, sand down a little bit to get kind of an edge to so that we can use it and maybe carve some teeth into it to help push and to work at removing excess uh, like fluff and um, really break down those fibers even more when the hide's getting more dry. So this will be kind of a wet working end and this will be more of a dry softening side. Using these to make a handled tool that's all one solid piece of wood so it's thick enough to where we can do a kind of beveled edge to it, and it still has the structural strength of with going end grain. And then we'll do a tool that's maybe wide at the top, comes down to a narrow handle and has a handle so it's more comfortable to hold. So originally I talked about using this like two by 12 for using a hand wooden scraper, but the, the two by 12 is a little bit thick for everybody's hands that are working on the project. So I'm gonna to switch to using the one by material. I'm looking on both sides to see where is the wood clear. So there's a knot here, so I'm gonna avoid that. And this section is good on both sides. It has a nice straight grain, so I'll use that. And then I'm just gonna sketch out the, the pattern. So I want a curved tool. and then we'll give it like a pommel on the end. If I wanted to make this perfectly symmetrical, I would take a piece of paper and do it, but I really don't, it doesn't bother me to have it not symmetrical. I'll cut out one and then do a pattern for another one and use it for that. So I'm gonna get the jigsaw back out and cut out the shape. So this seems a little bit wide, especially my hands are probably some of the larger hands in the project. So I'm going to uh, just shave off some of the excess. And this is much faster than taking it to the belt sander. So for me, like this is how I would test it for my hand and just see how it feels. I mean, this, this end grain is kind of rough, so this would be something that I would sand. And then I'm just gonna knock down these edges real fast. So as you're working on the hide, and this applies to everybody, and like as I'm um, making tools, you wanna be thinking good intentions. And um, it kind of translates to actually praying and having good thoughts so that whoever is going to be using the tool, whoever is going to be working with the hide, um, you want to be imparting that kind of like good thoughts, praying for them, praying for your community, praying and thinking good thoughts for people. And that's part of the reason why like you wouldn't complain about the smell because that's not really having good thoughts towards the moose, towards the people around you. And it's just part of um, making sure that you're being respectful and um, working together as a group of people and the world around you and really utilizing everything and um, treating things with care. That idea of praying or thinking good thoughts while you're working is very much a denying of value. And it's something that is being taught again. Some people automatically do it. Some people do it and they learned it um, maybe outside of a Denina uh, instruction model. And it's why a lot of times working is done without talking 
because you should be focusing on learning by observing, and then you're also focusing your energy on those good, good, good thoughts. And not that it's bad to talk while you're working, it just, you might notice that when you get a group of elders together, they're laughing and joking, they'll be quiet for like 15 minutes, and that's normal. Documenting the tool process is actually a critical part to documenting how to tan a moose, is you need to know, know how to make your tools. And even if, um, if you see a picture and being able to reverse engineer the process is, is a completely valid way of learning and is, is a traditional way of learning because you're watching something or you're observing something and then you need to figure out how to make it without a step-by-step -step instruction. So this is probably good now. It feels right in my hand. Um, I might take a little bit more of the pommel out, but we'll see how someone with smaller hands it feels and I'll bring the crooked knife and be able to tailor it to someone with smaller hands maybe. The nice thing about this compared to the ice scraper is when you're leaning into the hide you have a handle and then you can put your whole body weight into it. I might, I might sand down this edge, but it's still, it's pretty smooth. Um, and as we work, this might come splintering off. So um, we'll see how it goes, and we'll bring the knife, and as it splinters, we might just take the knife. There's no need to have this be like perfectly smooth and sanded and, and pretty. Um, the main thing is just that it acts as a scraping edge and a, a spreading, pushing instrument. The nice thing about having this really, th the thick part and that these edges are very dull is that it's less likely to go through the hide for slicing, puncturing, and it'll glide around a little bit better. And like this side, and you know, this is not perfectly symmetrical and it doesn't bother me. I made this very quickly and they may break and that's okay. We'll make another one or parts of this for the end grain might chip off and that's fine. So I'll bring the knife and just be able to kind of clean up the edges as we go and we'll see how it works. They pick some because we got a different kind out there. They're really round like this, and they're really thick. Sometimes they're not even round, they could be like this. So you take rocks and put it on the edge. Just keep doing that. To shape it mm -hmm. for whatever, whatever. Yeah. To sharpen it and shape it, to yeah, use it. Just, just do that. So, and it gets funny and then, then uh, then you keep using the skin, just the squirt, squirt. So this is the bindasi, and we would use this at the final step, um, softening the hide. Uh, it's a slate rock. So you hold it like this. There's different um, kinds of slate that you can find. Some of them splinter off really easily and they flake off too much. And then others, like the one you have in your hand, is really nice because it stays as a solid tool and you can really put a lot of pressure into it. And if your bindasi gets too uh, dull, you can just break off pieces to like kind of re-edge the tool, depending if you need it to become a little bit sharper. Mm -hmm. And the different areas and different mountains give you different slate. They're nice because they absorb oil and they put oils back into the skin, and then they also suck the water out, so it helps dry it out faster. Yeah, and Helen says that it's actually good to start with a larger bindasi because you can keep chipping it away as you go. So this is a tool that I made and I found a piece of stainless steel that was already curved and it goes to a back to here and it has a 90 degree curve in it already. And I used a cutting torch to just melt away the metal and stainless steel doesn't cut or burn through with a cutting torch, but it created a really gnarly edge. And the nice thing about the stainless is it doesn't rust so it won't stain the hide. But this is um, like the Bendasi, except with it being steel, it doesn't suck the water out and it's not as porous along the edge either. So this, um, you might find sharp spots where it could cut into the hide a little bit more than, than the desired effect might be. Um, so just, I went through and I filed some of those sharp spots off. I found the steel already. I drilled two holes in it. I cut out the shape of the handle with a jigsaw and then drilled holes in the stainless steel and just screwed it in there. And I wrapped it in the fluorescent duct tape so you can find the tools when you put them down because I'm always losing tools. This tool will be the stage where a bandasi is used and I would also use like a bone scraper at that stage and the reason why is it's really it has the teeth it's it's kind of scratching the hide and opening it up so that the hide's drying out more and this is just harder than the stone uh, and harder than bone so it's going to do something slightly different and that's why I like to use all three mm -hmm. and sometimes I'll even use wood tools as well. So it really gives a variety for what you're trying to work through. If there's a really hard section of hide, the steel is nice because it really 
bites into it and where the stone, it might eat away a lot of your stone trying to get that hard spot to soften up. So that's where I use the steel and then I'll go over with the stone to kind of finish it off. I'm going to glue these teeth into a wooden tool with epoxy so that we can use that as like a scraper that um, will kind of act like, more like a sanding action. We'll use it like a scraping motion, but it just exfoliates and scrapes and cuts off the extra bits of protein that become loose. So these are moose teeth that when I was making head cheese, I pulled the teeth out of the bottom of the pressure cooker. And what I'll do is I'll cut off some of the, the root part of the tooth and then have a bed of epoxy that's not been cured yet and then put, inset the teeth into them. And then the epoxy will set around the, the root and up the wall a little bit, kind of like a jawbone that comes up around the teeth to encase it slightly. And I have a, just a bunch of molars. And the nice thing about teeth is that they don't get clogged up like sandpaper or a pumice stone, that after about 30 seconds, now you need a new pumice stone. So stone tools, teeth, bone tools work better than some of the things you can buy at the hardware store. And the shortcut that Helen likes to use for, for this part is a wire uh, brush on the end of a, like a drill. And then it does the same exfoliating process. I tend to go through hide doing that. So I like to use the things that are a little slower because um, I just push a little bit too hard when I'm using the wire brush. I'm making a trough basically to glue the teeth into, so I give myself a margin from the edge. And then I'm going to use the tooth, this is my widest tooth, so I know that it needs to be at least this wide. And I'm using that as kind of a, a guide for how wide to make the trough. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll carve it all out that size, and then I'll fit the teeth in and make sure they fit. And if they don't, on this one, I'll just take my crooked knife and make it fit. And I'll do probably about four teeth's worth. This is just going to be like a bar and it's gonna be like a scrub brush. It'll be about the, maybe three inches wide, and you could use two hands and just go back and forth with it. I'm gonna check and see if I have a router and just router this out would be a lot faster than using the tool because this is slightly harder wood than this pine. So I have a trough in here now, and it'll be able to put the teeth in the trough and then position them correctly and then fill it with epoxy. I'm still gonna cut off the roots of the teeth because the, the roots of the teeth are attached but they're not as strong as the teeth themselves. So I'm gonna cut off most of it and then that'll just give a little bit of extra for the epoxy to adhere to. And it'll also give the chance for the epoxy to kind of go into the behind the teeth and fill in some of those gaps better. I'm going to use this paper towel in the vise to act as a slight cushion. I don't wanna crush the teeth. So these are slightly hollow, so that'll allow the epoxy to kind of go in on both sides of it instead of just like encapsulating the outside. So there we go. I'll do the exact same process for all four teeth. The next thing that I'm doing is just making sure that I pick out the different parts of teeth or the root that might have gotten clogged in the hole so that it's good with the epoxy getting in there. So I'm just fitting the teeth in here. If they, they fit, nicely, like a little snugly, that's good because it means they're less likely to come out. And like this tooth is the most loose one. And that's okay, it'll fill around with epoxy. And I'm gonna put a, a blob of clay right here so that we're not filling all this extra with epoxy. And then I'm gonna do an end cap here. So it's just gonna be this part of the tool. And I'll probably cut this off later. So I'm just working the, this is uh, oil-based clay and so I'm working it into those grooves. So I wouldn't use water-based clay to do this. This is oil-based clay. It's made out of um, wax and oils. This is a five minute epoxy and it's uh, 3,300 PSI bond strength and it sets in five minutes as the set time. It's a uh, water resistant indoor outdoor. I didn't get the, the waterproof kind because this isn't going to be submerged really. Uh, not worried about that. And then it has about 24 hour cure time before we'll use it. If you're thinking about how much glue is in here, if you hold it next to it, that's almost the right amount. And it doesn't have to be totally level with the trough. I might make it level with the trough, but we'll see how it goes. I'm just kind of 
playing with them into place so that it kind of can work its way in. That's the nice thing about having a clay wall here is I want the epoxy to come up a little bit more, so I'm just going to push the clay in. And it's about level with the side wall. And, and so let's let that set. When we're working on a moose hide, we use three different types of supports um, throughout the whole process. The first one we're going to use is a stationary tree that's rooted. So Jeannie says that we want to cut it to about like your eye level. You can put the hide over it and cut the hair off with a tsetse or a knife. And so you can hold it at the same time. The second support we're going to use is a sanded down log and it's usually about shoulder height and it's something that you're going to put the hide over so you can start to remove the membrane with the nagige or the draw knife. And so it's just pulling off all the rest of the excess stuff that hasn't come off after you've cut off the hair. Whatever size log that you have is going to um, dictate what kind of tool you're going to be using. So if you're going to use a wider log like this one, you're going to be using a wider draw knife, a wider nagige. Um, if you're going to be using a, a thinner log, you're going to be using a, a, a smaller nagige as well. And it's just all about the surface that you're putting on there. You know, and it's also nice to have a variety of different size things so you can switch between them and you're not getting too worn out with one size. When you're working on uh, the, a hide that just had the hair cut off of it, you're going to want to be really able to concentrate on one area. And when you're using a draw knife or nakige, you're really just kind of shaving off strip by strip. It's really a lot easier for me to work on a narrow log with a narrow blade um, because I can concentrate really on the strips and, the, and uh, each piece that I'm cutting off and really pay attention to that concentrated work um, of removing the remaining uh, epidermis and membrane. For me, using a smaller log is a lot easier because I have narrow shoulders, I'm shorter. You know, for someone who's, who's larger, they have wider shoulders, using something larger might be more comfortable. So you really want to um, pay attention to your body and the comfort level of when you're working on this really repetitive work. The third support you're going to use is a scraping beam, which is something that is a horizontal that you can put the whole hide over and you're going to use the bendasi or the rock, the slate rock, to soften it. So we'll debark this and smooth it all out and then put it in between two trees and so we can put the hide over it and scrape it soft. So Charlie was talking about uh, if you heat the bark with a propane torch, it's easier to peel because it kind of gets the steam's a little bit like the sap is almost running in it. This is a pretty fresh tree, so it's peeling pretty easily. But you just um, turn on your propane torch, spark it. Peel it really easy. So there's the wooden frame that's used for stretching out the hide. They use rope to lash it to. And that provides a couple of things. One, if you're going to dry out the hide, it's nice to dry it on a frame because then you have a smooth surface. You can roll it up and store it that way. It's nice to be able to use that for stretching the hide where you can walk on it and use your whole body weight to really start that initial stretch. And that's helpful, especially on thick hides. The other thing that's nice about it is when I'm working alone, every time I sit on the hide, I'm stretching it. Your body weight's always stretching it, and that works with, with more than one person too. So if you're in a group, you can have like four or six people sitting on the hide, and your body heat helps dry out the hide and your clothes absorb some of the, the moisture from the hide. At some point, you do have to take it off the frame and do that hand scraping or cabling because the frame keeps everything taut and flat and you need the hide to undulate and ripple. And so if you, if you never ripple it, it's not going to be able to do that later. So that's one of the disadvantages to working on the frame is if you don't catch it early enough getting it off the frame, then your hide won't get as draped like, like a fab, piece of fabric because it will have dried, stretched. The other reason why I'm able to do the, the lashing is um, onto a frame is because I have a large indoor space. So if you don't have a large indoor space, you're very weather dependent. 
because you have to have a big enough space to stretch out a like 14 by 14 frame. So if you just do the beam, then it all fits inside nicely. What the way that Helen does it is dra having a, a beam or a pole, and then you drape the hide over that, and you hand scrape on on it. Helen, Jeannie, and Charlie all talked about like just throw it over there, scrape it by hand, mm -hmm. and don't worry about the frame. So yeah, yeah. They said that the, it's a it's enough stretch, and particularly if you have a smaller hide, a hide that you want to be working on that's a little bit thinner and a young moose, you don't necessarily need to have it stretch. stretched out. And it stretches it on itself when it's put over the horizontal beam. So I tend to like flashing the hide to a frame and working on it that way a little bit more, especially on thick hides. I've tried it both ways, and for me it was one of the things that helped because I wasn't quite able to get it to the, a good stage sometimes without the frame. And so I go to the frame and then I just make sure that I take it off soon enough. And I'm starting to spend less time on the frame than I used to. We have this um, steel spring, and I'm gonna wire wheel it to get all the rust off so the rust doesn't stay in the hide. I'll use the, the hide either going over the top of it back and forth to be able to push and apply a lot of pressure to where the hide is stretching over it, or I'll change it to a vertical orientation and have the hide slide back and forth where it's being pulled this way, that way, and it creates friction, which creates heat. And you could do the same process with the cable, which I have a cable in the truck that we can try um, that's kind of more of a, a finishing stage. This is really just being another way of stretching and heating. And we'll make a mount on wood for this to sit in for that. If you didn't have this and you had access to like large rib bones, that's something that is curved like this that you could use, that you would mount onto something, tie, lash onto something. Or you could use a tree that's bent this shape. Or you could carve a piece of wood that was this shape. Or if you had access to large bones, you could use a large bone that's, that's shaped like this. The main thing about the curve is that it keeps there from being any sharp ends on it so that the hide can just glide over it because you're putting most of your pressure right here in the middle. As I'm gonna heat it up with like a cutting torch to get it cherry red and then bend it and then put a hole through it so I can screw that into wood so that it is firmly affixed into a wooden frame. The thing about metal is you can't really use metal to apply oils because the, the oil doesn't really work its way very far into the steel. Where when we're oiling the hide, we can put oil into the wood because the, the, the wood is porous and will actually release the oil back into the hide. So that's the difference between these two tools. This is used more as a scraping softener and the wood is used more for an oil scraping and softening. But since it's a softer material, its scraping abilities are less than the steel. So we'll, we'll use it kind of interchangeably, but they do have specific purposes for their, their materials and their porosity. So I'm gonna light up the, the cutting torch and just get a neutral flame and heat up this section of the metal so it bends easily, and then take it over to the vise, clamp it in, and bend it to where now I can use this hole that already exists and just put a screw through that into a wooden frame. We're heating up the metal till it glows cherry red, and then it'll be soft and easier to bend. So the next stage is I'm going to kind of quench that in the snow so I don't burn myself touching it. And then all of this needs to be wire wheeled. So I'll, I'll put a, a disc brush on an angle grinder and then wire wheel all the rust off of this. If someone doesn't have that tool, what else can they use? They could use a sander. Like you could use sandpaper. And I would start with a really coarse sandpaper because the rust is going to clog it up. And if you're doing this, this is something that you're going to breathe this dust. So a respirator is, is a safety thing. Another tool that you could use to start before the sandpaper would be a wire brush. So you brush, and now there's lots of dust coming off. The, the disc brush for the angle grinder, or even for a, like a, an impact driver or a handheld drill, either cordless or corded, will do the same thing. You could buy stock metal and bend it yourself. This is a spring from a vehicle, so you probably, I don't know if you could, you could order a brand new spring go to a or go to a junkyard and pull it off a vehicle. This type of tool is used more for advanced working and with a group setting. It, that way you have multiple people or like two people on each side 
of the hide so you can pull really hard and you get that, that group help. If you use it by yourself, it can be done. It's just a much smaller action. There's a metal one and a wooden one, and it's figuring out when the hide either needs the metal to soften and abrade the surface more, or when it needs to still be stretched and worked, and kind of like that heat friction happening without as much abrasive quality as the metal. So that's, that's kind of what that tool is used for a little bit more it also is it's a bigger tool and it allows you instead of using your your hands to pull you get to use different muscles and you don't have all that pressure on your hand holding a tool you're holding with hide and you can use your whole body weight and momentum to drag the hide across something rather than using your arm strength to push on the hide so that's really the, the asset to it is that you get to use different muscles of your body So this is a one inch thick board, but solid wood. I would not use plywood to do this because you're basically trying to exfoliate the hide. And when you do that on plywood, you just splinter all the plies apart. So you need to use wood. This is pine, so it's not ideal. You'd want to use some, a harder wood like birch. This will work though. You just may have to remake it more. It's about 12 inches wide. And what that'll do is it'll allow me to make a long curve in it because it's wide enough. And if I wanted to, I could make a really pointed curve, and I could make one that was more shallow. And the point will really give a lot more pressure at where that, the, the apex of the arc is versus if it was a shallow curve. So there's different, there's different curves for different purposes. I'll use the spring as kind of a, a shape pattern to draw, and I'll just trace a line where the spring is. I'm looking for a spot that doesn't have knots in it, and that is always tricky with pine, but there is a spot that's pretty clear grain right here and I'll cut this part off here and then leave this attached. Like, like. I don't necessarily need a softener that's that big, but because we have teams of people that are working, I'm gonna make it larger this time. So I'm free of all the staple marks and with the exception of right here, so I'll start it on that, draw my curve, and one of the things I'm going to do is slightly cheat it in a little bit like that so that it, it actually will have a little bit of a corner. Let's look at that angle. And then I can round that off. So what that does is it allows, because this corner will be rounded, we can use that as that pressure point. If, instead of making a arced um, kind of device like this that was more this kind of extreme angle, that's a shape that could be used too but now we can just use that corner. I don't have to make two of these. So now we've cut the curve and we're gonna take the, the belt sander and kind of uh, round off this edge a little bit to where it's kind of creating a very extremely blunt knife shape. And then also on these corners, just running it around to make that round a little bit and just running this to where it it kind of comes to a slight point that could be a rounded point, but just slightly beveled. We have finished sanding this and forming it, and I'm just uh, hand sanding, or we're going to hand sand. It's a little fuzzy from the belt sander because it's a really coarse grit, and it's a little dirty just from being outside. So just hand sanding off that surface to clean it. Any like wood chips that get that form get brought into the hide and may either work a sliver into the hide, and then as you're hand softening, you get a splinter in yourself or it might actually put a hole as a sliver works its way through. The edge now is kind of like a, a blunt knife where it's beveled here and there, and it's also beveled on this side here, and that way we can really take the hide and fold it across it nicely. And then I have some coconut oil that's thawing right now, and uh, we'll just oil it briefly, and that'll help to keep it cleaner, the oil just helps as a finishing for it. Hey, we're using like coconut oil and olive oil. Part of the reason why is that the traditional oils have very strong smells and bringing it into multiple different spaces. Some people have a hard time with that smell. The fermented fish head oil is a very strong smell. The animal fats work better than vegetable fats. Animal fats do a better job of waterproofing and lubricating. The plants just are what we're used to more today and people are willing to use. And coconut oil has a very good preservation uh, time frame. It doesn't go rancid very quickly. So coconut oil doesn't go rancid as quickly as like canola oil. So I tend to use coconut or olive oil and not Wesson or 
any type of vegetable blend oil, soybean oil, I don't use those. They go rancid much faster. I made a frame with like a box structure together where I did the, these two bottom brown boards first and then the side ones that are low on each side to have a, a kind of a square rectangular frame. And then I put the vertical posts into that. There's two screws coming into this two by four on the bottom. And then I put two screws going that way into the, the post down here. And so that was in, in placement. I got a chair, so if I'm sitting, this is about the right height to work this way. So this is a sitting, sitting stretcher. I did the same thing on this side, except I screwed, this is that spring part of the, the suspension of a vehicle. I screwed a screw in here, and then that hole where I bent the piece that had already had a hole in it, I put a screw in there as well. And then did the same thing where I screwed this together and that together. To make it not, because we're gonna be putting a lot of pressure on this, I put these side creases so that now this is a lot stronger than it was without these diagonals. So it's just kind of tied together, so it's more of a box. Tanning the moose hide, you would use a mixture of tools between uh, things that you would make and then also things that you could buy today at the store. So you would use a, a knife, a tetse. We have here just like a butcher knife, a really sharp butcher's knife. It's what we use to shave the hair off the hide. What Jeannie, Jeannie uses, her mom used, use it to just save it as you're holding it. So this is the nacheth, which is the draw knife. So it's uh, the tool that we would use after we have dehaired the hide, um, either by shaving or from pulling it off from being at rot. So you'd use this to shave right onto the um, log. So with the draw knives, there's a couple of different things to consider. One is the length of the draw knife. It kind of matches the shape of the log and the size of the log that you have. And also the size of your hands, think about how big the handles are so your, your hands don't get cramped from holding something that's too large or too small. One of them had curved handles and one of them just had a straight bar. And that kind of gives you different angles for how you can hold your wrists which is nice to give your body a break from doing the side action to then turning them in. You use different muscles all the way up your arms and shoulders to do that action. The, the bevel is down one side of it, and we sharpen that side, and then use it for uh, scraping with. This is the orientation for your hands this way. And there's also a bevel on the other side, which you can use if you're really just trying to get one spot and put a lot of pressure in one spot. But I tend to use this, this curved side more. So that's a 12 inch draw knife. And then there's this style draw knife, which is a little bit different. Um, it has the same like beveled edge to it on there, but the handle grip is different. And I would hold that like that. You draw towards yourself. Um, and again, you just sharpen this edge here and work down that way. This knife isn't one that's like keeps an edge very well, where the, the more this, the more expensive draw knives that are used for like planing wood or cutting wood work better because they keep a they're harder steel.